Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 66 Portland Place, the home of the RIBA. My name is Alan Valance. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Institute of British Architects. On behalf of our President, Ben Derbyshire, and myself, I'd like to say a very good evening, welcome, thank you very much for joining us for this Reba and Vitra talk, Intergenerational Dialogues with Kate McIntosh and Mary Duggan. This is our fourth Vitra talk and the final one for 2018. And it's one of a series of uh, 20, I think, or 24, over uh, two years, where leading architects will speak in events which will take place here in London, across the UK, and also internationally with events next year in Istanbul, Turkey. Our thanks to Vitra Bathrooms, who are sponsoring this prestigious series. We're delighted to have you here again this evening, uh, and we welcome Levant Giray, the Managing Director, Margaret, uh, and the team. Tonight's event is a sellout. That's four from four in these talks. And we're also live streaming the events on the RIBA's Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our website, architecture.com. So a warm welcome to all of you out there watching all of us in here. We're thrilled to be joined tonight by Kate McIntosh, MBE, best known for her 1960s social housing projects, including Dawson's Heights and the grade two listed Liam Court in Lambeth. After graduating in 1961, Kate gained experience in Scandinavia before working with Sir Dennis Lasden on the design for the National Theatre. Kate remains a stalwart and a vocal advocate for the role of architects in the design of social housing. Mary Duggan has established two successful practices. She was a founding director of Duggan Morris Architects from 2004 to 2017, uh, at which point she launched Mary Duggan Architects. During her time at Duggan Morris Architects, the practice uh, received numerous awards, including no less than 10 RIBA national and regional awards, three nominations for the Mies van der Rohe Award, the Stephen Lawrence Prize, and the Mansa Medal. This year and next year mark important anniversaries. In 2018, we're celebrating the centenary of the women's vote, and we'd also like to recognize Kate's work towards gender equality as she was in fact the first chairperson of the RIBA's Women's Architects Group. And next year, 2019, marks the centenary, the 100th anniversary since Parliament passed the Housing Act, which promised government subsidies to help finance the construction of 500,000 houses within three years. That sounds rather topical. Social housing is a perennial topic of discussion, and on the eve of this anniversary, the RIBA reflects on this important subject in a series of events and displays we have on. Beginning with a home for all, six experiments in social housing, which is a collaborative display uh, between the VNA and the RIBA architecture partnership, which is just opened at the VNA. A display of photographs here of Kate's own um, Dawson Heights, which is upstairs in our first floor gallery. Uh, which, and that, those pictures are drawn from the RIBA's architectural press archive. And of course, our talk here this evening, which celebrates social housing. Finally, a couple of points of housekeeping from me before we begin. We don't have a fire alarm planned this evening, but if there is and you hear the alarm, it's the real thing. And the exits can be found over to my left on your right and also at the back of the hall, but our staff will direct you out. You're very welcome to keep your mobile phones on. In fact, I encourage you to tweet as if your very lives depended on it but please turn them to silent or to vibrate. Uh, if you are a social media user, please feel free to tweet or to Insta. The hashtag for this evening is RIBA Vitra, or one word. Uh, a thanks to all my staff, the hardworking team at the RIBA, uh, you know who you are, who do an awful lot of work behind the scenes, but uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to make events like this happen, so thank you all, um, and you'll meet some of them shortly. Without further ado then, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kate McIntosh to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, it was uh, 1965 when I arrived at the um, Borough Architects Office of Southwark 
and was presented with this quite extraordinary site, plus a brief for just under 300 dwellings, those dwellings to be of various different sizes. So the two driving factors in evolving the design for this, um, uh, this very extraordinary um, location were first and foremost to maximize the benefit of the views, and secondly that the um, geo-engineering um, problems that the site presented were quite profound in every sense of the word in that the hill was on um, London clay and constantly on the slip, which had caused the um, demolition of the properties which were previously occupying the site. And the engineering solution was 30 meter deep driven piles. Um, the um, expense of that foundation uh, solution meant that it tended to mitigate towards militate towards um, trying to reduce the footprint of, of the building. So the solution I came up with was these two, a pair of stiff ziggurats, which are staggered as far as their high points are concerned and um, diminish in scale towards the extremities to reflect the surrounding suburban scale. And um, the staggering is to minimize the blocking of sun and view so that uh, every dwelling gets um, a view in a, a distant view in at least one direction and two thirds get a view in both directions. All the living rooms are facing south. Uh, many of them uh, have, um, all the dwellings have a balcony. Um, and most, many of the balconies are to the south. And um, the whole is clad in stock bricks, uh, which gives um, a visual unity to the, the totality, which unfortunately is being intruded upon by the now owners, which is Southern Housing Group, who um, see fit to slay the a, a sort of ghastly fungus of cream render across wherever uh, a small problem arises with the brickwork, even if it's just a bit of graffiti. So, so that is um, an, an erosion of the visual quality, which is ongoing. Um, I wanted to um, avoid what uh, was then the standard solution to local authority housing of um, separating the smaller dwelling sizes from the larger ones uh, and, and to get a complete, as I saw it, natural mix of um, different family sizes so that there would be a greater opportunity for a social gel. Uh, my theory being that as um, family sizes vary, so the needs and capacities of those families would tend to dovetail and complement each other and, and lead, hopefully, to um, social bonding. So you see here, I devised this um, rather complex interlocking system of uh, what I call a, a Chinese puzzle, of whereby a two-bedroom, a three-bedroom, and a one-bedroom are all accessed off the same access way. And uh, the, f the four bedroom ones, which are the green, are um, coming off the lowest access way. The um, lowest part of the tall blocks flips around at 90 degrees, both to give a greater sense of containment to the central space, the central space being on roughly the scale of Tavistock Square, which, near which I was living in Bloomsbury at the time, um, and also to allow even the, the uh, families which were coming off the lowest access way the maximum convenient uh, route to get, get to a lift. Um, 
Uh, and um, so the, these shots are in the exhibition. No, no, the, this, the, these were taken by Bob Kirkman, who was the photographer at uh, Lasden's. Um, unfortunately, to my mind, um, when Southern Housing Group took over the scheme, by this time this is uh, during Thatcher years when Alice Coleman's edict on um, a accessibility being a, a deficit rather than an asset in social housing, um, these uh, bridges were taken out, which I regret. However, the um, one benefit of um, the actions of um, Southern Housing Group was that they designated the lower part of the slope, which was deemed to be completely economically unbuildable, as um, a nature reserve. Uh, so effectively, it's a public open space where um, you can go and study nature, and you can also go and watch the fireworks on the 5th of November. So do go along. Um, I then moved to Lambeth um, in 69, um, and there I was given a brief for a much smaller scheme. This was sheltered housing um, on what was the garden of uh, what had been a substantial Edwardian property, uh, which had the advantage of being well treed. Uh, sheltered housing was then regarded as the, the latest thinking in accommodation for the elderly, offering the maximum degree of um, autonomy, uh, but with supported living. So this is um, a brief for 44 dwellings, uh, a flat for a living in warden, a common room, um, a communal laundry, and, and um, other communal facilities. The brief was for um, one bedroom and uh, one person and two person flats in um, the ratio of one to three, which allowed me to produce these setbacks at um, first floor level so that every f first floor flat gets quite a generous roof terrace. Um, and the whole is linked by a covered way which, where it intersects with the cluster blocks, does a joggle, so it increases in width, and this allows a space where residents can linger outside the entrance to the cluster block if they encounter a neighbour that they want to chat with in a, in a spontaneous way and still allow other people to pass by, uh, once again, to try to encourage um, the social gel. Um, so um, this is a section through the communal staircase of a typical eight flat block uh, where the, there's a, a s s more generous space outside the front door of each flat where people can personalize it. Uh, and uh, there are lay lights allowing natural light into this space. Um, now, in um, 2012, Lambeth, having neglected this uh, scheme for about uh, 40 years, decided that they wanted to uh, rehouse the occupants and uh, demolish the buildings and sell off the site. And the um, the residents were highly resistant to this and uh, sought my uh, advice, which was to go for listing. And um, Docomomo put together a, a very expert application, uh, which uh, was successful. And in 2015, it was listed grade two. So we all sat back and thought, all is well. Um, and Lambeth even then voted a sum of money for uh, catching up with the, um, uh, the neglect and uh, decay that they'd allowed to happen. So what was my despair and disappointment in June when I got another appeal for help from residents 
uh, to come and advise them on how they could resist this illegal work, this illegal um, brutalization of a listed structure. Um, and that has been occupying my time quite a bit since then. However, I must um, tell you, if you're not aware of it already, that there is an absurd legal anomaly whereby a grade two listed building, which is in the ownership of a local authority, and that authority is abusing the listed protection, there is no higher authority that can step in and prevent it. They can appeal to their own planning department for retrospective consent, which is precisely what Lambeth are doing. So to turn now to happier times, um, in, <laughs> in um, the early 70s, um, George Finch, my life partner and I, bought a property, a property in northern Tuscany, Casa in Casa or Rustica in uh, Provincia di Lucca, in a tiny village. It was in a very dilapidated condition, but um, we uh, were very happy there. And um, I was very struck by the um, quite simple but beautifully proportioned and powerful campanile of the traditional um, Romanesque Tuscan uh, churches. And so when I moved, we moved to Lewis uh, and I joined the East Sussex County Architects Department um, in 74, uh, my first job was a fire station in Hastings, um, Halton it's called. And um, I thought, uh, well, why should drill towers be such banal and uh, totally utilitarian uh, objects. Um, architects very rarely these days get a chance to design a, a vertical feature, a landmark, um, and so this is my shot at doing something a bit better. Um, the base there is a, a hose repair shop. Now, the um, aesthetic problem of fire stations, to my view, is how do you resolve and produce some unity when you have uh, what is effectively a quasi-industrial, one and a half story equivalent industrial shed, namely the appliance bays, adjacent to um, a building which is administrative and domestic in character. And my solution here was to envelop the whole thing in a big roof. Um, uh, and this envelopment is um, carried out in zinc, zinc being a material which reacts quite favorably in a saline climate and has a suitably tough sort of image to it. Um, so my next job, once again for the fire brigade, um, I'm very fond of the fire brigade, uh, and I think they are of me. Uh, <laughs> This is um, a training headquarters at Maresfield. Now this tower, as you see, is seven stories. The normal height of a drill tower is five stories. Um, and um, the trainees are uh, put into a veritable pur purgatory within this firehouse down below, where they have to fumble around in total darkness uh, it's completely full of smoke, and it's at 100% humidity. Uh, and uh, the tower itself can also be smoke logged. There, the apertures, there are steel shutters come down over all the apertures. Uh, if they survive that, they graduate to become a fire person, firefighter. Uh, if they panic, and there's a monitoring office down at the base of that sloping roof, which is all through audio communication. If they rip off their breathing apparatus mask and collapse, uh, they bang on the um, exhaust fan and go in and rescue them. So that's all quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> it gave me an enormous respect for the fire brigade, I can tell you. 
So in addition to that, there was this uh, little block here, which you see um, where there was a lecture room and uh, obviously the showers and uh, lockers and drying equipment and all that sort of stuff. It's in the deepest rural Sussex. So I wanted it not to be too intrusive, as far as you can make a seven-story drill tower not intrusive. I located it beside the tallest tree on the site, which is this massive great oak that you see there. So um, then I moved to the county of Hampshire, um, where I had yet again a relationship with the fire brigade. Um, <laughs> This is the largest fire station I've done, which is a five base station with the possibility that it might increase to a six base station. It's a 15 man watch with the possibility of increasing to uh, an 18 man watch. Um, it's adjacent to the Farnborough Airfield where of course they have the Farnborough Air Show and um, so that potentially major incidents can occur there, hence the importance of the station. So it's um, a frame structure, and at the intersection in the roof there, uh, I located the pole drop. Um, the fire brigade pride themselves on um, a three-minute turnout from sleeping rest. Um, so uh, in, to my mind, uh, the... The pole drop serves a very useful purpose, apart, apart from getting them there very, very quickly. It makes them alert. I've done a pole drop, so I know it happens. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, um, here you have the dormitory. That's the main dormitory there um, uh, for the men. There's a, a, another dormitory for the officers in, in another location. You could divide fire stations, which are quite complex buildings, into opposites. There's clean and dirty, there's quiet and noisy, there's highly regimented and relax and socialise. And they do need to relax and they do need to socialise in order to get that camaraderie and that trust which they need in extremely dangerous situations. So... Um, when they return from a shout, as they call it, uh, they go, having uh, showered off and got some clean clothes out of their lockers and so on, they go into the mess, which is here, and then they go into the common room, which is here. And below there, above there, is the, um, the lecture room. So the, all the quiet activities are at first floor level and all the noisy stuff is down below. Here is what were fire prevention officers. The government in their bonfire regulations have scrubbed this free service that the fire brigade offered, principally to architects, of course, to uh, advise on how to design safe buildings, the consequence of which, in my view, are a number of fatal accidents. And I'm sure you can call to mind a few. So this is the road frontage, and um, you'll see once again, I'm concerned about this unity, unifying the two aspects of the building. Um, and there you see the drill tower in the, on the far right. Um, this is contrasting the uh, very um, the highly disciplined um, aspect with the more relaxed and... Uh, um, socialising aspect. Um, and here we have the three drill towers. Halton, which is uh, under threat because it's being closed because of austerity. Um, the mayor's field, which is the training one. Here you see the firehouse and the staircase coming down. And lastly, the um, Rushmore. So moving on to a more gentle client type. This is a replacement infant school in Hastings. Um, it's built on rising ground, rising from the south to the north, and on the ridge above, there are a series of forts dating back to the Napoleonic Wars. 
The um, fort above this one is known as Purbeck Fort. If you ever want to go and visit this school, you can locate it by Purbeck Fort. It's on the site of a Victorian reservoir. Uh, so um, the, um, whoops, uh, the ground here is steeply banked. And because it's on fill, it's on short bore piles. The, um, I decided to locate the classrooms all along, more or less following the contours, and they're south-facing with the teaching deck in front, uh, a very substantial roof overhang to cut down the soil again. And this is the assembly hall with a music suite there, the um, secretary's office there. This is the main formal entrance, but the kids enter under the school. The school bridges across um, on this slope. That's, say, the able-bodied kids. If they're in a wheelchair, they have to go around that way. Um, so this is the playground. And um, the um, classrooms have this linear dormer, which runs right the way through. And at this point, there are two dormers which overlap. And that allows a very effective ventilation as they can open the windows to the south and then by natural stack effect, they can exhaust through this dormer. And I was assured that they, they've never overheated those classrooms. This is the um, main assembly hall, which has um, diaphragm walls because of the height. The only two-story part is the teacher's common room, which has this staircase going to it, where they can get away from the hubbub and racket of uh, their teaching life, but they still have a view over the playground so they can get out there if there is anything untoward going on. Uh, this shows the two entrances, so that um, here you've got the music and drama suite, here you've got the hall, and off shot, just here to the right, is the secretary's office. And this is the kids' entrance. And above that entrance, over the bridge, is the head's office. So she is a little bit remote from the main entrance. So if there's any stroppy parents coming uh, who haven't got an appointment, she's well tucked away. But at the same time, she can also get out on the teaching deck if there's a fracas going on here and make sure those kids know they're being supervised. And here you have the, um, the interior of the assembly hall, also used for dining, of course. And this is where the uh, stagger occurs in the teaching bank. And that's where the library, the school library, is located. So it's. Uh, known as central resources. All, all the kids are aware of it. It's completely accessible. So moving on now to uh, something happened here. Oh, we've missed a slide. I'm sorry. Um, uh, this is um, a, a sports hall for um, a grammar school, it's a listed grade two grammar school. In Hampshire, we respect our listed buildings. And um, this uh, grammar school, shot of which I had hoped would be there, um, is um, dating from 1903. It's um, English Iranian Baroque, uh, red brick with limestone dressings. Um, and um, so, and of a substantial scale, it's uh, four, three very, very tall stories. And um, it's on to quite an ancient high street in, in Fratton. So the um, sort of treatment that um, sports halls often receive of the imperforate box uh, was plainly not appropriate for this location. Um, I want to relate to the, the scale of the, and dignity of the old grammar school, but there was also a requirement for um, a music suite and a, um, 
a letterable pub public room, community room down here. So that allowed a mediation between this um, rather giant scale here of the, um, of the sports hall and two-story uh, Edwardian terrace, which is off shot down here. Um, we, um, in Hampshire, uh, very much espoused the philosophy of Jan Gell that uh, every public building should make a, make a contribution to the public realm. And, and that was uh, part of my intention. So I put in this um, central window here. This is also a multi-purpose hall, so it's used for exams. It uh, can be let out to the public for social events. So uh, the, this tall uh, gable wall is also a diaphragm, so it's very thick, and I could build in um, the shutters to give a rebound uh, surface. Um, so I'm going to go on to this. This is the interior. Um, this is a viewing gallery up here. These are all semi-engineering bricks, but buff for the interior to give a better light quality. And through here is uh, our keep fit suites. So um, going back, this is uh, at the other side. Uh, you see there's also a, a Victorian Gothic building here, which is a former um, Catholic seminary, uh, now incorporated in the school. The roll call on this in this school is 1,200, and the site is undersized for that number of kids. So we wanted to create also some um, places of repose where kids could uh, uh, relax externally. And this, this was such a space as uh, this was another one where um, this is in relation to the dining room, which is here, which is also undersized for the role. Um, and the kids were always spilling out into this space, which when I first went to the school was just an area of hard-packed hard -packed mud. And uh, this was my attempt to produce something a little more um, uh, full of repose. So... Um, this is my final scheme. This is, um, I took early retirement from, uh, from Hampshire in um, 85 and uh, went into partnership with George Finch. And we got um, a commission from um, a charity running an adventure playground in a very poor suburb of, um, of uh, Southampton. When I say poor, it had a very, and still has no doubt, um, unemployment levels. But um, at that time, they were operating out of precast Marley garages uh, and the very steeply sloping site. You can get 300 kids in the school holidays using this site. And the fact that the crime levels in this area are quite low the police put it down to the operation of this, uh, this adventure playground, very, very dedicated play leader. So we wanted to give it our best shot. We were really inspired. Um, so um, we also uh, wanted the building to be in accordance with best sustainable, sustainable practice and uh, uh, we decided to clad it in green oak. The structure is um, mainframe of, um, of steel uh, with um, subframe, a timber subframe and uh, green oak with um, uh, cellulose fiber, very thick um, insulation. And we decided at an early date to uh, jack the building up one story off the ground uh, both to increase the inadequate size of the site, give the kids a place where they could play in bad weather or when the weather was extremely hot, and um, to um, 
relate to the intermediate level of the playground. We plateaued the playground, so it's actually now at three levels uh, with retaining. And um, that meant we had to put in a, a big ramp here so that there was access for the disabled or indeed mums with buggies. All along the, um, this is the east side here, is uh, a gallery which f uh, facilitates uh, ease of supervision. This is the um, play leader's office here with a wraparound window. Um, and uh, we wanted the whole building to be a, an object of play. Uh, so there's a bridge here which relates to the main play level. This is the interior. Um, this uh, mezzanine here uh, allows views out across Solent, the estuary of Solent water uh, at a raised level, so it's less liable to be damaged by um, vandals. Um, it's a quieter area for the kids where they can go and practice, hone their computer skills, donated computers. And underneath are Okay, um, <laughs> uh, there's copious um, uh, storage, very necessary. Um, this is the green oak and the ventilation, passive ventilation as with Solent School, um, and the gallery, uh, very robust detailing necessary and materials. These uh, extremely energetic kids, thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was really inspiring. Um, I wanted to uh, present two projects today. Um, two projects that are, are very different in brief uh, scale, budgets and outputs, um, but united, I think, by concerns relating to home, place, perhaps displacement, and memory and, and bring those particular concerns into the foreground for the purposes of this discussion today. Um, by memory, I guess I mean reflections on um, the past, on appraisals and critiques of, of, of previous historical works and the context in which they were built in. And this idea that we are constantly looking back and trying to, to take some lessons from the past so we can take them forward into our new architectural proposals positively. Um, so the, the two projects are, um, one is a, an exhibition that we completed in um, March and June this year, sorry, for the Barbican Arts Centre. And the second is a very large uh, uh, residential scheme that we're currently working on with Brick by Brick, uh, who are London Borough of Croydon, local authorities, development partner. Um, so to talk about the Barbican exhibition first, um, the, the commission was to design a support structure for to display Dorothea Lang's um, a record of her career and in, in fact she um, entitled The Politics of Seeing. Briefly her biography, she was born in 1985 um, in New Jersey. She moved to San Francisco where she set up a, a portrait studio and spent much of her early career um, photographing the uh, social elite, I guess, and, and established herself a firm grounding and a good living out of this profession, this portrait studio. And then there is this point in her career in the, in the 1930s where the... Um, the American Depression is, becomes, she becomes very aware of it. Unemployment and poverty becomes very visible. And she has this um, epiphany moment or a, or a, or a kind of uh, extreme uh, reaction to it, a social consciousness. And it's at this point that she makes this departure and her vocation very quickly switches to that of a documentary photographer, and that's what she pursues for the rest of her career. 
And within her career, she photographs essentially the, the American Depression. She, works for, she worked for the Farm Security Administration, recording the plight of the displaced farm workers. And then post Pearl Harbor, she recorded in great detail the uh, Jap uh, Japanese um, incarceration. Um, so I guess charged with the task of designing an exhibition framework for 300 loaned photographs. So in one level, perhaps, is quite a simple brief. Um, she is described as someone, I actually like this quote, as someone who humanized the consequences of the American Depression. And that's something that we felt that we really needed to understand what that really means and, and to bring her work, to how, to how we would start to understand her work in a way that we will be able to communicate this in an atmosphere within a, 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 in a, a, um, an exhibition environment. So to, 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 to give some examples of her work, this is, these are three photographs from her work with the FSA during the American Depression period. This is an image of a dust cart, um, a, a migrant family who would have been displaced from their home um, if you look at it, it's, it's a highly emotively charged photograph, two young children li just living with probably their worldly possessions, which would have been displaced very quickly from their house, from their home, po probably their neighbourhood, shoved into a cart with this promise of uh, a destination in another place with, with equal um, weight and, the, and this idea, this hope that they would be um, rehoused somewhere else. We talked a lot, in fact, my associate Will Guthrie in my office, we talked a lot about this roll of vinyl, this piece of material that would have just been ripped out very quickly, a piece of material that would have been considered to have value in its place, a, a material value, and had, have, has this potential or this hope that it would be replaced somewhere else. And then similarly, uh, another... Probably similar scenario, uh, a, a family photographed quite happily outside a shelter that they probably would have built out of salvaged materials, materials that they may have collected along their journey or dismantled from their previous living to, to, to establish the, the sort of bare minimum of a, of a shelter to enable to, them to take uh, cover from the, from the weather conditions, probably without any other um, uh, living um, material other than that. So we, we were interested, and, and, and I guess the last image is perhaps more architectural. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a farm building, a, a, a mill building, also sort of built out of the bare essentials. Um, and within this, I think what moved us most was the, the lack of materials, but also the optimization of materials. But the, 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 our reaction very much was, uh, was, was related to what was actually missing from, from these images, the lack of no community, no sense of place. And I guess wanting to think how we might build a structure that would support that and perhaps find a parallel me meaning within the exhibition framework. Um, we had a very, very clear, um, amazing curatorial brief. The Barbican team are, are fantastic and we, we, we knew that we were going to have to display this work um, chronologically. So, I hope this is legible. So, I think the idea that the, the core concept um, was to try and design and construct an exhibition framework which would, in a way, make present the absence. And that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but to try and speak of the conditions and, and through a, a series of architectural decisions and moves that we would recreate that atmosphere. Um, so the idea, very simply, was to start with a complete room a complete room that would be reminiscent of Dorothea's uh, original portrait studio, complete in the sense that it's fully lined, it's painted, it's well lit, it contains images of the, of the, the portrait work, and it would have its home comforts. And then after that, we would start to, through a series of galleries, all tailored and uh, sized to suit the particular works that were being displayed, 
that the, the material co uh, components would start to become evident. So we would strip back uh, and deconstruct or dematerialise is, is a word that we used a lot to try and reduce the exhibition material to its bare essentials. So walking through the exhibition, this is the first room, beautifully lit, um, evidence of uh, skirtings, picture rails, dado rails, etc. And the second, um, the second frame in from the left-hand side is a portal that then exposes the construction of the, the rooms behind. So you immediately see, you see a paired back gallery, the stud work exposed, and the bare minimum materials to display the works. And on the, within this enfilade of the series of rooms that are, 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 dis, are, are shifted across the gallery, we get this purposeful um, shunt between the rooms where you catch the public off guard and you, you force them to, to sort of witness the, the material decisions and the very raw conditions. And this finally is the, uh, her, her most iconic image, which is the image taken in 1936 of the migrant mother. Um, that is displayed uh, fairly central to the, to the gallery. And th uh, this is the image actually where um, the image that was circulated across America. And actually, in this, in this process, all of her photography was, was provided free to the press. She did bring this, uh, the plight into the conscious of the, of the country and, and actually um, resolved and um, uh, enabled enough contribution to, 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 to save lives. Um, so it's a work that's inspired by conditions, looking very hard at you know, humanity in one level, thinking very hard about creating an atmosphere and to heighten the conditions and the, con uh, uh, and the consequences. And, and therefore, we felt through the, through the execution of this exhibition and a, pre a, a level of appreciation of the work. So the next project, shifting up to from an £80,000 scheme now to, into a project for um, Brick by Brick, uh, London Borough of Croydon's delivery partner. And, and in simple terms, so my, my understanding of that is that it's, a, it's a, a structure in which the local authority are the single shareholder of the uh, commercial enterprise. So there is, through that business structure, a shared and genuine concern to deliver high quality affordable housing in increased numbers across the borough. And I believe that within three years, they have almost uh, trebled the quantity of, of, of affordable housing that had, has been delivered within the pre preceding five years. Um, they have an ambition to deliver 2,000 units by uh, 2022 and an attitude about uh, transformative architecture, high quality architecture. They deliver their open book with their profit margins, the, the, the land values, uh, which so their profits are obviously less than a standard house builder, but they're very clear about what it is and how it can be reinvested within the, within the local authority. So, the site is um, in Coolsdon, just to orientate. Um, London is up here, Brighton is down here, and there are two tributary roads to take you to those respective destinations. Um, the brief, we had uh, a number of units, uh, uh, an ambition to deliver a high number of units. A site that is unusual in that it has uh, lots of suburban dwellings to the northeast, as you can see on this, on this image, uh, a, a suburban housing model that we, could, we, we felt there was an opportunity to take and draw that grain into the site. You have Coolsdon city centre to, to the north of the site, but actually a very sort of frayed edge of the town containing Victorian converted minis, um, mini dwellings and, and light industrial. But then to the south of the site, a very large open piece of uh, parkland um, and a, a historic uh, scheduled monument just at the back of the site and a very busy main road to the front. 
Um, and then there is a swathe of kind of replicated Barclays uh, suburban dwellings being constructed over, over a number of years around the back side of the field to the, to the south and the west. Um, I guess in, in some, um, we, we were torn actually, we were really interested in the open land at the back. Um, we felt that there was a condition here that we could capitalise on and that our view, this is an image taken from the back of the site just behind the mound at the high point on the site, looking over um, towards Coulsdon city centre. And what we were really taken by was the fact that you, you read the buildings between the trees, not really the trees between the buildings. This is, a, this is a picture that's very much about a landscape. And perhaps the landscape should be our start point for the scheme. Um, so conceptually, um, we were interested in trying to find an even balance and, 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 and really thinking hard about a, a conceptual start point from the, for the project. Uh, wanting to give greater weight, perhaps, to the landscape. Um, so this is a conceptual model, obviously. This is a, a, a tray of pigment, um, and the compacted cast in the middle is concrete and pigment of, of the same material. Um, and we had an idea that within this landscape, we would then position the buildings, but then start to scribe these pathways through the landscape and then taking another model and positioning it very carefully next to it that there might be an idea about a, 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 a kind of casual relationship of a series of pavilion structures that would find their feet within this landscape. So, obviously, in parallel, we're developing uh, planned structures, but, 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 but really got tied into a, a kind of... A, a, an organic formation, um, a series of buildings that would, would, would sit very carefully in quite specific positions, but positions that were really led by the, land, the, the landscape description and a level of salvage that we uh, started to unravel during, through the course of the study. Um, so this is the final arrangement. It was five pavilions in a kind of five dice structure, I guess. Um, all similar, all actually identical in plan form, but finding, finding a bed within the, the site topology. What I've, what I've failed to tell you at this point is that there's an eight metre drop from the top to the bottom of the site, um, which is, is actually a slow fall, but nonetheless, when you start to account for moving ground around, considerations about footings, creating massive hard standings, all of those things, it starts to, to uh, uh, complexity starts to emerge through that, 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 that um, um, sort of technical issue in, in terms of the, 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 the viability. Um, so actually, the, the heights of those buildings, not dissimilar to Dawson Height, the, the, the tallest structure is at the back of the land, but you actually lose its height in, in the upwards perspective from the road. And then the other buildings vary between five and seven blocks, depending on and their relative height, depending on where they're resting within the ground condition. And then right at the front of the site, the lowest block just here, respects through this height proportion, the height of the buildings directly across the road. Um, so what I've decided to do is to sort of break down a whole series of decisions which are made in consideration of the sort of ground level activity. I think, I think it's fair to say that now we don't have the budgets to really expand beyond uh, spatial standards, so ideas about um, uh, long gantry, sort of wider, wider corridors, sort of elevated, have become actually quite difficult to deliver. So what, but what we became interested in here is actually this being a landscape-led scheme, allowing a level of fluidity and a level of interaction at ground floor, potentially constructing ideas about the neighbourhoods would be the thing that we really needed to interrogate in, in, in every single aspect of, of those layers at, at, at ground level. So quite simply then, this is the existing site, generally white. 
All of the trees in a slightly darker shade of green are the trees that we have analysed working with Planet. We have worked through a process of understanding that they're the ones that we need to salvage. We can salvage them. Then we add trees to that, um, uh, to the, to the landscape scheme, and those those trees have been carefully chosen and specified, low maintenance uh, 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 considerations about longer term, longer term keep and also um, soil conditions and, 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 and what have you. Then there is what we're, we're calling loosely a park. It isn't a park, but it's the sort of the public layer within this uh, series of um, decisions at ground level. It's Croydon, so we have to account for cars. We have to account for car parking. Um, we felt that they need to be, whilst this reads as an island, we felt that it was right to distribute them around the edge of the site so that when eventually they, they start to peter away, um, it's not quite like London, but there may be less of them, those car parking plots could potentially be given back to, to landscape. Then we add these meandering footpaths, very careful consideration, a lot of work gone into making sure they're one in 21. So there are slow meandering routes which take you from the road to the back of the site and into the parkland to, to, the, to the monument as well. And then we add the building plots. Um, and after that, so we have at this point a landscape. I've, I've omitted slides, I've failed to include a section so I'm gonna have to use my hands. So we have a, a, a landscape at this point which is sloping from front to back. And what we're doing here is we're resting a series of pavilions across that landscape. And in doing that, we have these, we've, we've designed in these projections shown here in pink, which are uh, terraced extensions at the front, at the doorstop of each of the units. So that means, we think it means, you have walkways which are public, publicly accessible, then you have a raised terrace. You don't get to that terrace unless you walk up a ramp and you're a resident and you arrive at it. It's your address, you live there, you're private, that's why you use that terrace. So obviously what we're trying to avoid here in utilising the section is, is, is a scheme that becomes fenced with, with some very hard edges. We know it was raised lots of times that there is this problem, what do you do when the walls hit the, hit the ground? How's, where's, how, where's the public and private zone in here and how is it addressed? Well, that again is addressed in the section because we don't have, due to the fall, the lie of the land and the solidity of the building towards ground level, we don't have a condition where the glazing or a balcony is closer than 1.8 metres from the ground level. Then moving through quickly, quickly. <laughs> um, the other consideration that we've made is we have a pinwheel plan. I, I do have some plans which I can explain quickly. We're, we're confident that within the upper floors we've got a building that's multi-directional, 360 degree surveillance, a, a core through the centre, every single unit with a corner aspect or a dual aspect. But at ground level we thought, okay, well at the front door what should we put there? How do we distribute the ground level surface, surface and make sure that the, the resident routes are, are permeable and there's a, there's a level of fluidity within that? So what we've done is we've distributed the services. So at the front, you, you'll arrive at your front door. It's a very large terrace, a very large meet and greet, door stop play. We're talking with brick by brick um, to uh, include an allotment programme which would be connected to that. But at the front, it's post box, it's front door, it's bikes, and there's a gardening shed. You exit at the back, and that's where you have refuse and recycling and your access to your car park or your parking plot or your um, zip car in, in, in a kind of future scenario. So there's a lot of resident activity at ground floor as well. And then as we move up, obviously we've got the M4 compliant units at ground level. And as we move up, a distribution of uh, three ones, two twos, and one three in a floor plan that is uh, repetitive. Um, so, and then at, 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 the, at the top floor level, we have um, setbacks. The setbacks, a slice off each of the blocks designed to free up some space for the mature trees, open up the skies in the areas where it's slightly 
tighter and also open up the views to the uh, ancient, ancient, uh, scheduled ancient monument at the back. So I guess in, in terms of the, the building thinking, it, as I described, it's a, it's a very simple pinwheel plan. At ground level, we have an entrance terrace, we have tool sheds, we have bikes at the back, we've got refuse and services. So we have this sort of permeable plan at, at ground level. And then going up, a very tight, you know, on the, on, the, on the standard numbers with these corner balconies looking across betwixt the building, multi-directional. Um, but what it is, in, actually, it's three plans. The three plans play out across the site. Um, they're all exactly the same. They just find a, a kind of position at ground level, an entrance kind of not quite facing the other. There isn't a kind of tight structure to this. It's more of a kind of casual, casual, maybe slightly huffy relationship between front doors. And they, they land and they rest in a, in a position which allows the front doors always to be visible from Lion Green Road. Um, and then one of the plans hands, but actually there's a lot of repetition in this. Every single corner, every single balcony is identical. The facets are always the same, apart from the area that, 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 that hangs over the, the entrance lobby. So finally, that's the final plan showing the setback, opening up large terraces to the larger units on the, on the, on the upper floors. And then internally, I think what, what, what's, what we feel is really important about this scheme is it's not just about resolving a ground condition. We accept that, there's, that, that there are layers and layers of activity at ground. It's meandering. We're encouraging. We're trying to find and set out those conditions that will bring forward a neighbourhood. Um, but then when it, do, it shouldn't stop there, when you get to the, the upper floors, you're reconnected almost immediately through this idea of these very deep, wide log lodges, and then that, that, that you heighten again that sense of connection to the landscape. And finally, this is an image taken from Lion Green Road, looking underneath some of the retained trees through the Bluebell Woods, through to the, um, the, through to the block set at the, at the backside of the site. checking. You can hear me? Um, thank you both. That was fantastic to have um, a double lecture no, from both of you. And uh, I just want to, uh, hopefully I won't be speaking too much, but just to introduce myself. My name's Shumi Bose. I'm one of the curators of exhibitions in Reba's public programs team. Um, and yeah, just on behalf of all of us, I think, myself included, thank you for both of those lectures. I feel extremely privileged to have both of you here tonight. <laughs> and to have both of your works displayed in, in shows. Um, but having, given that we had two lectures, I'm going to jump straight into a few questions and get you talking to each other, because I think that's what most of us um, want to see. So there were lots of themes in um, both of your talks that, that made me think of, you know, the distance, but, but also the parallels between both of your careers. And given how active you are, um, Kate, now, in, in terms of being vocal for social housing advocacy, it almost feels a little bit mean to ask you about back in the day and Dawson's Heights and so on, but do you think you could offer any sort of, um, perhaps some abiding memories about working with a local borough council on social housing at that time? Perhaps you could speak to um, some of the feeling or the sentiment around producing social housing, because then I'd like to hear similar from, from Mary. Nearly forgot. Um, well, it was such a different world that um, it's almost like um, I'm zooming in from a different planet. Because at that time, it, there was a, a cross 
party political consensus that uh, the fundamental needs for a civilized society of decent shelter, education, health, were a responsibility of government. And um, that has evaporated. N not just the conservatives, but of course the neoliberal agenda was adopted largely by Blair as well. And despite the exposure of its hollowness with the financial collapse in 2008, uh, it continues to be zombie-like, still dominating political policy. Um, and so, in my view, um, the whole arena of uh, social and uh, any housing uh, as marketized is utterly and utterly dysfunctional and something has got to change. Um, this uh, is encapsulated in a, a recent exposure that uh, the um, conversion of uh, center point uh, by developers, of course, um, into luxury flats, uh, a decision was taken that uh, half of them, 82 in number, would be taken off the market because the offers coming in were regarded as non-realistic. Those offers were not coming from UK anyway, they were coming from abroad. Meantime, of course, around the foot of center point, you have a little encampment of tents where the homeless are in, indigenous, men, many of them, um, left to freeze in, in the winter cold. Mary, do you think things have, have changed? Are we seeing, in your work with Brick by Brick, are we seeing a sort of change or even dare I say, renaissance in, in attitudes towards socialising. It's a very different model. No, there was state-funded and then there's yes. something else going well, on. I guess my experience has been more recently the, the Brick by Brick um, project, which and they are operating a very different structure, and I'm, I'm very aware of that in designing housing, affordable housing and private housing, and I'm aware that there's a, a significant shift in the, the numbers that they're, they're aiming to deliver. Um, Compare that with other other um, private developers. It, it, it's very very different. So so one I feel is is a very genuine concern. You know we're we're trying to do it. We're having on some level the same conversations about viability, about land value, about all of those things. But there is a genuine exposure of the numbers. Compare that to a private developer. There isn't. There's there's quite, quite often a discussion about the ambition to deliver numbers which actually it doesn't. It, to, to some level it translates into something that becomes a marketing program, not actually a, a delivery program. What about but the, I think... Sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, what about the value of architecture in, in these things? It seems like at Kate's time, if I'm not being too romantic, it was perhaps possible to be an architect and imagine that you might make your living from designing social housing and designing it well, whereas, Mary, I don't know if you feel this is an exception to the rule or, well, or I not. Was, I, I was at the age of 27 to design a scheme like that. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's sort of... I think it says a lot about how architects were perhaps respected at that time, that, 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 was, that you know, there was a greater belief that you were able to resolve a problem which is spatial, which is about designing high-quality architecture. I think... Today, a lot of the front end of the design concept development is very much about you know, an Excel sp spreadsheet, trying to generate the numbers, trying to work out where the viability lies. Mm -hmm. Am I being romantic, Kate? Was it possible to imagine social housing as, as your career as an architect? Certainly. Uh, um, there were, I don't want to romanticize about um, that era because there was a lot, quite a lot of substandard social housing produced. But um, during my uh, professional lifetime, design and build came into being. 
And I can remember it was uh, in the late, 40, uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, it began to you began to be aware that there were contractors in London, started in London, of course, who were putting surveyors on site specifically and solely in order to build up claims. And um, gradually, but gradually, the money men took over the construction industry so that the, the small to medium-sized builder who still existed out in the counties, who were more interested in producing a decent job, a decent standard of building, and knew how to build, they began to be forced to the wall and be taken over or went bankrupt. The last scheme I did at um, uh, Hampshire, the Solent School, the contractor was Miller's. Miller, Miller's originated from Edinburgh, I crossed swords with them there. Of course, they're uh, now notorious for the scandal of the defective schools that they produced in Scotland where they, there were no wall ties, the brickwork was just falling off. And that is the most nightmare contract I've ever had to run. And uh, if it hadn't had an absolutely superb team Marvellous QS, and we had Clarks of Works in those days. Clarks of Works, do they exist anymore? We didn't, they didn't get away with it, but it nearly drove me mad. <laughs> I don't know if you have questions to, to ask um, Kate about that experience, but, but otherwise, I wanted to perhaps move from social housing just for a moment, because we're slightly short on time. But the other obvious parallel between you both, and I'm privileged to say, is that you're both highly respected and successful women practitioners and obviously those attitudes and that climate has changed as well I hope although perhaps not as much as we might think so I also wanted to get your sort of parallel reflections on what it is or was or how it might have changed being a woman architect and, and what you might have faced um, perhaps Kate if, if we could start with you when I graduated, uh, women were a little bit over 4% of the profession. Um, when we set up the Women Architects Group, um, when was it? Uh, 1980, I believe, you yes, set that up. 85 or something like that, we reported to council. It had climbed up to a bit over 6%, so that's very slow progress. That's women actually practicing. Um, the increase in women that's actually practicing within the profession has gone up at about half a percent a year since then, which is very slow progress. Now, uh, in my view, the main obstacle to uh, women reaching parity with men in the professions, not just architecture, but architecture particularly because of the long hours culture and the highly competitive nature of the work, um, is the lack of good, affordable, reliable childcare. In Scandinavia, where I've worked, in Sweden and Norway, the relationship within the architectural profession, gender relationship, is 50-50. And there, uh, in, in UK, the proportion of your salary you have to pay out for childcare is over 40%. In Norway, I think it's about 5%, and in Sweden, it's a bit over 7%. That is the difference. That is the obstacle. For parenting should not be an considered an individual matter. The well-being of children is the future of the nation, and the government should take responsibility. I'm so glad you said so. I'm so glad you clapped. Mary, what's your experience? Uh, my experience, I think when I graduated, it was 13% um, women. Um, I... 
In, in establishing Doug and Morris Architects, uh, what Doug and Morris Architects championed um, was equal. We always had, I think, through the 14 years, 50-50 split between women and men, um, more or less maintained. Um, lots of female applications, actually, whether that was because I'm, there was one female director, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think through my career, which is now probably hedging up to 21 years, there are many more women staying in work, coming back after having children. Um, one of the concerns I have, and I think there's, there's reasons for the architectural education uh, programme, which I think the average from beginning to end is still nine years. The moves within ed education, whilst that's very much about, we're talking very much about fees, I think in trying to embed professional practice much earlier on in education, I think that will encourage uh, a greater degree of diversity across men and women, but the, the, the possibility to step out of architecture for periods, men and women, to enable them to um, look after children or to, or to take sabbaticals or to pursue some sort of other activities within that. I think considering the, the longer term, because for women... <laughs> By the time you actually decide, you're kind of already, the clock is ticking. And I think that is a massive problem for, for women in architecture. How do you both feel about being role models for women? Is that something that you wear willingly or knowingly? Because or, you are both, mm. both personally, but also for many in the room. Does, how do you feel about that? Um, do you want to answer that first? <laughs> <laughs> I wear that badge with pride. <laughs> no, I'm very, I'm very glad. I find it interesting because when I speak to you both about your work, you're, there's absolutely no nonsense. We go straight into talking about the buildings, um, mm. the, the parameters of, of getting them built. Um, but you are held up as, as women who have been able to practice in seemingly or assumedly very difficult circumstances and I wonder if that's ever a, an uncomfortable thing to wear if you would rather just be an architect rather than being introduced continuously as a woman architect or, or is that again something that you're learning to wear differently? Mm. I mean I'm, I'm, very, I'm very conscious of it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel you know it's very privileged actually so, so very, my backdrop is I was educated on, I'm one of four girls, I was educated on a full grant. All my sisters were educated on a full grant. I don't actually think that I'd be sitting here if that wasn't the case. And that's something that's hugely important to me and something that I really wanted to say this evening. So I'm, I'm here as a female um, and I, I want to be successful. I want... Um, I, I want to get to the point where my work matters and that I, I, I'm a, a strong professional. Um, I don't know whether, whether out of that, I don't think yet. I'm, I'm very happy to sit here and, and, you know, Kate is absolutely a role model. I'm not quite sure if I'm at that point yet, which is probably why I'm shuffling my seat and feeling quite awkward about it. But my, I don't think my mission is complete. I, I wouldn't want to describe myself as a role model at, at, at this point. But I understand I stand for something. I, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate there's a movement and, and, and I'm a figure within that. Great. I think um, I think I'll probably just I don't know again if you have questions for each other more than more than welcome but um, there's a there's just a few minutes we have left and then I think I'm stretching our conversation to the end those of you who need to leave sharp on 8 30 please please do but it'd be nice if you would do so discreetly and then I'll open up to you in a few minutes to take just a few questions um, so please get ready, because we don't have much time. If you have your questions ready, that would be great. Um, OK, tough one to end on. <laughs> um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to producing the kind of high-quality buildings that you've both striven to, produ to, to produce in your careers? What, at the moment, from your vantage point, from having such a long and prolific career in many different parts of the country, what do you find to be the, the biggest barrier? And, and, yeah, I would say... Um, from having a co-founded practice mm. and then having your own, which you now run very much on your own terms, 
it'd be interesting to know what barriers you think face the emerging generations. Procurement. Um, it's very difficult to um, get onto a framework, for one. The frameworks are generally, the, 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 the assessments are, are always about fees. Mm -hmm. um, design quality is, feels like it's very low in those assessments. Um, you know, that's a whole subject, a very complex subject. I think, I'm, you know, at, at this point in my career, I'm, I, I probably wouldn't qualify to, to get onto any of those frameworks. I know incredible architects who are, there's a constant struggle. There's departments dealing with uh, public procurement questionnaires and the like. Um, viability. You need an intelligent client who's able to break down and, and put forward strong viability documents to really understand what it means to interrogate a number of schemes at the very early stages, to have a genuine ambition to deliver. The planning system is uh, a, a, a massive problem. Most of my projects are stalled by at least one year due to the lack of skills and the, it, within the local authorities, and that is really holding back uh, a lot of, of architectural projects at the moment. Mm. Kate, we talked about maintenance at a certain point when we were preparing for this. Do you think this is something that's preventative in any way to producing good, successful housing, or, or are there other things that you would think are more obstructive? I think that... Is this working? Yes, yes. it's fine. Yes. Um, you have to be quite close to it. The, the um, uh, short-termism of uh, the market, the commodification of everything... Um, leads to a degradation of the principle of cost and use assessment. Uh, we should all be aiming, as I'm sure we all try to, for low-maintenance buildings. And on the whole, the higher the initial investment, provided it's sensibly controlled, the lower will be the lifetime costing uh, uh, of the, the building over its uh, running and, and maintenance. So a more long-sighted sort of political agenda would, would promote that, and, and then you would get architectural quality properly valued. I think, um, I think it's about time, perhaps, then, that I open it up to the audience. There are microphones around the room, so if you have questions for these two very special speakers, please stick your hands up and, and my colleagues will come to you. Okay, there's two down here. Oh, um, it's a question for Kate, really, but um, Mary, maybe you've got some input on this as well. That your career is based around good institutions. Education, which Mary talked about in terms of getting a grant, but the, the, the projects you got. And we see with Macintosh Court, Liam Court Road, the, the failure of institutions, the failure of the local authority, the failure of the planning department there. Um, there's a final line of defense, which is the heritage movement and the institutions there. How have they worked to help protect your work there? Docomomo have been extremely helpful at every turn um, in the struggle to expose the uh, appalling behavior of Lambeth. Um, for some reason, the 20th Century Society seems to have rather held back. Um, of course, there is this legal anomaly that I mentioned that uh, Heritage England, um, Historic England rather, um, is p apparently powerless to, to intervene in this situation. Um, and uh, there is no higher appeal. Secretary of State, of course, wouldn't do anything, especially not when you've got people like Roger Scrutton being elevated to being some sort of beauty tsar and wanting to uh, promote Poundbury wall to wall across the entire country. Um, Enough said. Um, any more questions? Um, 
Yes, gentleman here. Thank yeah. you. Um, how do you create a building, a building that lasts and choose materials and persuade the client uh, to adopt a material that really lasts the test of time? Let me push that to Mary. Well, there's only one material in London at the moment which seems to be brick. And I think that it goes back to, I think, what Kate's talking about. We're very much tied into uh, cost models and it tends to be that those sorts of decisions in the first instance are driven by what a, what a cost model dictates. I think it's, it's very, very difficult in practice, particularly outside of housing at the moment, to prove that anything other works. There are, there are brick is a proven material. And to step beyond it, to even say the word render, render which can be comp very interesting to talk about precast, to talk about masonry outside of brickwork is, is hugely complicated because we're tied to an industry that dictates that housing can only be delivered at a, a certain rate and those external walls are very much locked into that structure. I'd, I'd just uh, like to... Um, tell a little story about uh, the, the last project I showed, which was the um, Adventure Playground, which was clad in green oak. Now, um, as you know, I'm sure, um, green oak is very liable to be disfigured by the leaching out of black tannin. And um, so I uh, set my mind to think how to overcome this problem. And um, I devised a, an accelerated weathering, because weathering, of course, is very largely an oxidization process. Um, and I can tell you the, the secret if you're interested, but <laughs> at no charge. <laughs> um, the pre prefixing treatment, but also to give those substantial overhangs so that the the building face was largely protected from um, from the driving rain and uh, it seems to have largely been successful so that, that, that was very satisfying okay just one more I think we might have time for there's a lady at the sort of middle back there with, with glasses if you stick your hand right up then thank you <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering, as you both are working on social housing, um, obviously, like, the client is the council, but when it's completed, it's more like, so the residents take a large part of maintenance, and I was wondering if there, like, any, um, I want to ask you <coughs> Sorry. about your opinion, like, of involving the residents into maintenance or, like, conserve the building well? Mm. I mean, I was, uh, there was a question, thank you, there was a question I was going to ask too in terms of the community response or indeed involvement in any of your projects. We have two community members here and I think there's a third somewhere. There are, would you like to share your opinions on, on, on involvement in Kate's projects and maybe there are things that you want to share too, uh, Mary, in terms of your work in Coulston. Okay it's, not a, okay, it's not a question. I'd just like to say to Kate, thank you for creating Macintosh Court. It's a lovely place to live. And secondly, for all the, for all the help she's given us this year in fighting Lambeth Council and all the illegal work that's gone on there, mm. she's put in a lot of hard work and concern for us. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just like to say that prior to moving to Macintosh Court, um, I had visited many sheltered units and they did look quite institutionalised. Mm. When I walked into Macintosh Court, it looked like a result, resort that needed a little bit of work done. And I was told that Lambeth were going to make it look fantastic, mm. really look forward to living there. And it is like a resort until you get the, constru you know, the construction crew in. They've absolutely ruined it, I'm afraid. I mean, I'm looking at these pictures here. And they're clear, they're clear buildings. Our building looks like St. Thomas's Hospital. Mm -hmm. We've got huge pipes all over the building now. Mm -hmm. It's been absolutely ruined. And we're there 100%, Kate. You support us, we're supporting you. We're, gonna, we're, we're going for it with Lambert. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
That's it. Fantastic. What, a, what an amazing story to hear that participation doesn't end, knowing those consultation meetings way before anything gets built, but indeed continues decades after the building. What about uh, you, Mary? Have you got any, any stories involving participation or, or even the sort of reaction from your, um, the community in, in the borough of Croydon? How do you feel they responded to your designs? Um, <laughs> The design, very positively. Um, the, 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 the biggest problem was trying to reduce the number of car parking in this, this area. That, that was the, 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 the biggest issue, actually, um, talking about parking numbers and trying to persuade people that actually car clubs and those sorts of things were actually the future. Um, that, that was a battle that we lost, and as I said in the presentation, the result of that was accommodating it, but just thinking through what the, the future might be once those spaces started to diminish with new generations not completely 100% reliant on, on cars for their transport structure. I think I'd just like to close by just inviting if you have any reflections on seeing each other's work tonight, because um, I know we've sort of engineered this conversation between you both but then we've met and there's been quite a lot that we've shared over emails and over lunch and, and so on I wondered if you had any comments for each other just to close the event well I just really love the softness of your presentation I think lots of black and white photography freehand drawings models that you, you probably made yourself and I was looking at it thinking, oh, everything I'm going to show is sort of generated through a computer, bar the cast models and bar, you know, that there's free hand in my work, but a lot of it is, is sort of driven now digitally. Um, and that, I think that's something I really, there's a level of kind of belief when you talk about it. I really feel that you, you, you own it. I saw the signatures on some of your sketches. That's so missing today in, 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 the, in the production of the work. Lovely observation. It, it took me quite a while to be persuaded to use a computer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's lovely to get away from the scratchy scratchy when you're, <laughs> when you're having to make alterations. <laughs> I, have, I do still have um, quite a lot of uh, hand drawn presentation drawings from the fire fire station work in particular uh, which I, I think I'll give them to the v &A. Is there anyone from the v &A here? Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll look after them, Kate. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't know if you had any comments uh, on Mary or indeed on the conversations that we've had today, but, but if not, then... Well, uh, yes, I'd, I'd um, like to say how I admire the way you're negotiating your way through with um, with Croydon, and I, I do wish you every success with this. <laughs> uh, I've sought advice for from other people working for the boroughs as to how you get past the constraints of and the disappointments of design and build. And I'm advised if you can persuade the client to let you take it up to RIBA stage four. Mm -hmm and then get novated as well, you've got more of a chance to actually control yes. the, um, the quality. It must be heartbreaking to hand it over and then you find the bloody contractors just bastardizing the whole thing. <laughs> Very good advice. Let's, let's end on that, you know, pragmatic note. It's been such an honor to be here with these two unstoppable, passionate architects. Thank you so much, both of you. If you join me in thanking both of you. And last but not least, if you haven't quite had enough of, of their work, as I'm sure you haven't, just to invite you again to the Dawson Heights exhibition upstairs, which is open from tomorrow until February, and um, A Home for All at the V&A, which features the Lion Green Road uh, project, uh, which Mary kindly showed us today. Lots more about that at the V&A if you'd like to get over. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Good night.